Hi, thank you for joining me. This is Dr. Amy. Today we're talking about zonulin, which is an add-on marker to the full GI map, or it can be ordered as a standalone test. Before we get into zonulin, we need to talk about the function of the GI barrier. So our GI barrier has a lot of functions in our body that are really, really important to overall health and gut health. So the barrier is responsible for nutrient absorption from the lumen of the gut into the body. It's responsible for water regulation, for regulation of the balance of minerals and solutes. The barrier is protective from the contents of the lumen, so the lumen is technically the outside of our body, and it keeps that on the outside under normal conditions and selectively allows things through the barrier. So it, it allows the selective passage of antigens across the mucosal layer into our body. And a little bit about the regulation of the GI barrier. It is dynamic, it's very tightly regulated, and there are two pathways. So the transcellular, which means things going through the cell, and then the paracellular, which means things going between the cells. So we'll be talking a lot about the paracellular pathway, which is where zonulin is involved. Tight junctions are proteins that regulate that paracellular pathway. And zonulin regulates the tight junctions. And tight junctions are not just regulated by zonulin. So zonulin is not the only player in intestinal permeability. So TNF or tum tumor necrosis factor and IL-13 or interleukin-13 are two more players among many that can regulate those tight junctions. Now let's talk about zonulin. So this was discovered in 2001, so it's a fairly recently discovered protein. It is a single chain protein produced in our body by our own GI epithelial cells, so the cells lining our gastrointestinal tract. It's also known as pre-haptoglobin 2, which means that it's a precursor to haptoglobin 2. And it reversibly regulates permeability via the tight junctions. So in an ideal situation, zonulin will come and it will go, and it will open up that space between our cells, and then that space will close again. Here I'm going to briefly illustrate the effects of zonulin on the tight junction. So this is from a paper by Alessio Fasano, who was the person who discovered zonulin in 2001. So here we have the zonulin protein, we've got the receptors right here, and then we've got our tight junction. And this is a picture of the cell membrane in its resting state. Now, once zonulin binds to the receptors, you'll see this cascade of events. I won't go deeply into this, but it results in the opening of this tight junction. So you'll see the whole tight junction is wide open, allowing things to pass through the paracellular pathway out of the gut lumen and into our body. So this is the picture to contrast with the first after the pathway is activated. We see a lot of disorganization there. And again, the normal action of zonulin is to bind this and then unbind it. So this is a reversible action. So it's really that chronic state of high zonulin that will cause the issues with intestinal hyperpermeability. So if zonulin is a problem clinically, why does the body produce it? I would argue that everything produced in the human body has a physiologic purpose and is beneficial in moderation. It's really that chronic state of activation that's the problem, and zonulin is included in this. Zonulin production is normal. It's a normal part of GI physiology. Normal zonulin production signals the opening of the tight junctions, the reversible opening of the tight junctions, which allows for passage of larger molecules and nutrients from the gut lumen into the body, into the bloodstream. It allows the balancing of water-soluble compounds. It allows for immune access to the gut lumen, so that immune system comes from the body to address anything going on in the gut lumen, which really allows for protection from organisms. So if there is something present, like microorganisms, pathogens, high-level opportunists, that will trigger the release of zonulin, the opening of the tight junctions, and then inflows your immune system. So zonulin production is not the problem. It's the chronic production of zonulin that is the problem. So why do some people produce more, more persistently than others? 
here are a few of the factors. So genetic upregulation of the zonulin genes, exposure to microorganisms, so chronic exposure, exposure to gluten, and this is more pronounced in celiac patients and people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but gluten actually triggers the release of zonulin in everybody. Chronic overexercise, chronic stressors on the body. So there are more than this, but these are some of the major factors that can lead to that chronic elevation in zonulin. So gluten consumption does have a big impact on zonulin release. This is an image of gliadin, which is one of our breakdown proteins from gluten. It will break down into glutenin and gliadin. And these two blue regions are the two regions responsible for zonulin release and gut permeability. So for anybody that's eating gluten, you do have these proteins that can bind and cause that zonulin release. These next two slides I'll go over very briefly, but we've got a huge list of conditions that are officially associated with elevated zonulin. And then clinically we do see some things, but in the research these are well documented to have that link with chronic elevated zonulin, chronic intestinal hyperpermeability. So we've got a huge list of autoimmune conditions, we've got a lot of cancers. So moving on to things like nervous system conditions, and then also non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is associated with elevated zonulin. And then clinically, we see some other things, like we will see brain fog, fatigue, low energy, uh, joint pain, food sensitivities, difficulty losing or gaining weight, lots and lots of symptoms associated with that high zonulin that are not exactly diagnosable conditions, but more subclinical. Taking a look at GI map, you'll find zonulin on page four. And again, this is an optional add-on test to GI map. So here we see the zonulin is very elevated. And this is our reference range, 175 nanograms per gram. And this is a fairly high reference range. So this is a person that would need some work around zonulin. They may need some help with regulating their GI barrier function. Maybe we need to look at that list of things that can lead to chronic elevated zonulin and address some of those. Now here we see this person also has an elevated antigliadin IgA. So they've got a gluten sensitivity, not necessarily celiac, but a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is very, very common to see together with a high zonulin. And this is a great slide. So this is a chart put together by Tom, Dr. Tom Fabian, who is on our team. And this is the other findings on GI map that might lead you to suspect intestinal hyperpermeability. And I put this on here to illustrate that zonulin is not the one and only piece when it comes to intestinal permeability. You can't just look at a test and say, oh, well, zonulin's normal. They obviously have a fully normal and well-functioning GI barrier. So no, when you look at the test, we're looking for things like pathogens, really any high pathogen can work on that gut and make it less, less patent. Low lactobacillus, low or below detection limit, acromantia mucinophila, high candida, so candida actually can invade those epithelial cells and lead to barrier permeability. Here we've got our antigliadin IgA and our zonulin, as we've discussed earlier. And then for poor mucosal health, we can also look at things like low bifido, low escherichia. So escherichia, you might think E. coli, which is pathogenic, but the normal escherichia are actually partially responsible for the recycling, the healthy, normal recycling of our epithelial cells and mucosal production. Again, low lactobacillus, low acromantia, and then the phylum, when you look at page two, you'll see the bacterial phyla, bacteroidetes and firmicutes, and bacteroidetes in particular, when it's low, we can be thinking about poor mucosal health. So don't just look to zonulin. It's easy to look at a test and think, oh, you know, that looks normal, no big deal, but do look at the rest of these patterns, and these are available in our interpretive guide, which you can find on our website, on one of the last pages. So when you have a patient in your office and you're suspecting intestinal hyperpermeability, which is going to be a lot of your patients in your functional practice, 
here are a few things you can do. So let's talk about diet. Let's keep it very, very simple. So we wanna look at high polyphenols. So lots of brightly colored fruits and veggies. We wanna increase fiber. We want the legumes, if tolerated, we want lots of veggies. We can do a fiber supplement. We wanna take out inflammatory foods and any foods that that person is sensitive to. We wanna remove gluten also as part of that. And then we wanna go low in our processed sugars. So basically a plant forward, anti-inflammatory, high polyphenol, high fiber diet. When it comes to lifestyle, we wanna do things like avoiding alcohol. So alcohol can lead to that gut permeability. We wanna keep our exercise moderate, vigorous but moderate. We wanna take in really good water sources. We want to reduce our non-essential prescriptions. So things like NSAIDs and other prescriptions can affect the gut barrier. We want to rule out gut infections. So this is less lifestyle, more clinical. Things like, yeah, chronic Klebsiella, chronic mold, chronic candida, things like that, and any infections. And then time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting has been shown to positively benefit the gut barrier function. There are a lot of supplements you can add in for gut repair, and a lot of companies make great pre-formulated powders and capsules and things like that, which can be really, really helpful for compliance. A few favorites are glutamine, butyrate, polyphenols. So those you can get through fruits and veggies, but you can also get polyphenol uh, supplements pre-mixed. Fiber, either a supplement or in your diet. Omega-3s probiotics, zinc carnosine, vitamin A and vitamin D, a brush border enzyme. And this is not so much for repair so much as when the gut barrier is affected and the epithelial cells are less than healthy, you may be lower in your brush border enzyme production. And that's going to be responsible for the digestion, that last step, breaking down your dipeptides and your disaccharides. So really important for getting those nutrients into your body is going to be supplementing those brush border enzymes. And then biotin or B7. So again, there is a longer list of things for gut repair, but these are a few of my favorites to look out for in your products. So thank you for joining me on this quick presentation on zonulin. I hope it was helpful. Hope it helped you understand that protein just a little bit more. Again, this is an optional add-on to GI map.